Um, I don't understand. He was there on vacation. Maybe he was doing a podcast or something like that. That's pretty. Yeah. yeah. by Tule, this is you inspire us inspiring stories about all things bike i'm elliot jackson a bike ambassador for Tule, and this is our first episode of you inspire us we're going to be bringing episodes from around the world at events like these so that you can get a little bit of the feeling that we feel when we're here and it's actually saturday at crankworks we're recording live uh, my guests and i just saw one of the most insane slope style runs of all time um, speaking of my guest, I'm speaking to <laughs> Martin Soderstrom. He's a legendary bike athlete. Um, I think he's your favorite rider's favorite rider, you know, slopes, speed and style champion. Um, he's coached and, and kind of the, uh, he's known as the Swedish godfather. So <laughs> wow, keep <laughs> thank, going, keep going. <laughs> thank you this so much. Good. <laughs> thank you for being here, Martin. My pleasure. That was a very nice introduction. I got a lot, a lot to live up to now. I yeah, feel like. it's um, sad to say that it's all downhill from here. But <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so I wasn't planning on starting here, but um, I, I want to hear your thoughts about what we just witnessed. So Emil Johansson is now the most winning slope style athlete of all time, and you know from the outside, I think like Emil's tricks are super technical, and I, I almost can't tell what he's doing. So for you, what is it? What was that run like? Oh man, it's uh, he is impressive. It feels like almost for the first time in the sport history. Or like Brandon Semenak, Brett Reeder, they also were pretty much the full package. But Emil is really like he's got the mental game, he's got the focus in training, and uh, yeah, he's he's got it all. And as you say, he's very focused on the on the technical stuff. Yeah. And I and I understand that for people that haven't watched Slopestyle that much. They don't really understand it. It yeah. looks like almost that he's doing the same trick yeah. the whole way down. But that's the thing that he's either he's spinning one way and then on the next jump spinning the other way or throwing the bar one way and yeah. then on the next jump the bar the other way or the bike one way and the other way. And it's super hard. Mm. I mean, everyone had probably heard about this thing when you um, tie your shoelaces with the uh, Ah. The well, like start with the wrong foot. Ray, so like, yeah, yeah. That's not that hard. Yeah. Come up with something that is hard with, but like throw a ball like with the wrong saying, hand. Like if you actually, there's no way I could do a um, bunny ears like loop, swoop, and pull, starting the opposite way. No, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, 360 triple table tables are a bit harder than tying your shoelace, but you get the point, all right. But I think it's interesting because, um, do you think that like slope style kind of has to go that way, like? We saw like double backflips. We saw Nikolai Rogatkin doing 1080s and stuff like that. Like, does it have to, to increase the difficulty? Does it have to go that way? And maybe actually it would be interesting for you to kind of like talk about the progression of the sport as a whole. I think the mix is really good. Like we have the riders that is more like, yeah. <laughs> it's just really like spin it to win it. Yeah. Like Nikolai and it's really putting his life at risk almost every yeah. run it feels like. And then we have the guys that are more super calculated and are doing trying to squeeze in many bar spins and tail whips, which is maybe not as high risk, but is in difficulty maybe harder than spinning super hard. So it's, yeah. I like that part of the sport where you have some riders that are super technical, and then you have some riders that are more just really throwing themselves out there and risking their life 
and sometimes maybe that can also be good for the the show yeah i feel like as well that we have those riders that are really yeah i, I would say we need both it's mm. it's a good uh, it's a good mix now we have emil on one side nikolai and then we have david godsick that is a little bit of both he's right, got right, some right, technical right. tricks and some like more just really heavy duties i mean i definitely want to get into like your background but did you ever imagine that slope style would look like this like is this you know 10 years ago did you say oh i bet people will be doing you know 360 triple tail whips in the middle of a run i mean you kind of understand that with almost every sport it's gonna be pushed and pushed and pushed yeah. and pushed but so i i think i was actually i think i was the first the first rider to do a 360 triple whip on on a mountain bike really so it's pretty much putting the whole yeah, yeah, you're like, like, <laughs> complete now you're like yeah i actually uh, yeah i i know exactly what that feels like <laughs> i didn't try to be uh <laughs> But uh, so, uh, but it's a lot different. Like back then, it was like a big roll in, a really big jump, and I just like did it and kind of slipped the pedal. And but I was like, okay, I landed it. Yeah. And now Emil first do a drop, then do a triple tail whip, and then keep on doing tricks the whole way down. Yeah. That is so 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 impressive because yeah. how precise you have to be to land exactly on the pedals and then keep on going. And we could actually, actually in Emil's run, we could see that he actually slipped the pedal yeah. on top of the whale tail and still somehow managed to like ride up the right. lip without one foot and then still do a 360 do truck drive. That's crazy. Which is a pretty big trick. That was yeah. probably the trick I would have done back in the day on that one, but he did it with, 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 it was really like a safe, <laughs> the safest thing he could do was one of like my go to tricks so yeah. that so in that way you can really see how the sport have developed yeah. and I was, um i was this progress do you think right like it's not like you guys weren't riding a lot and like pushing it and taking risks yeah and now like how does that work do you feel like it is weird i now when i'm coaching some students and i hear the younger kids talking you almost get upset because they sometimes say like oh if i was riding back in your day i would be a pro and you're like ah, yeah it doesn't really, it doesn't really work like right. that. totally <laughs> it's because uh, everything is developing right? yeah. it's, it's they have watched riders doing bigger tricks when i was a kid maybe you watched a backflip and were like oh i didn't know that was possible on a bike and now they're watching the kids are watching triple flips right and that's kind of where they set their bar right. so it's uh, and also you can tell now that airbags foam pits mm. all these stuff um back in the day was a lot more like yeah, yeah you were you would i i remember my brother doing a backflip at our dirt jumps and like it was the end of the day we had we had like dug up the landing to try to make it soft yeah. and like it was insane like you you had to do it to dirt the first time yeah it was uh, definitely different but i would say it's better now yeah <laughs> right? because uh, back that wasn't very healthy to always uh, and also as as you say it's good for the product uh, progression of um, of the sport yeah. i mean and that's what we talked about as well with emil that is really he's really training yeah like sometimes when i was at the top of the like at my top level sometimes i even got back from an event and i was like okay next weekend there's another event i'm not gonna bother to take out the bike out of the bike bag because it's already packed so i would just like okay i chill a little bit until the next weekend but now it's a lot more like they come home they build a bike and then you train again just yeah. like any other sport so i can i can sometimes miss a little bit i can yeah. i can sometimes feel like i just want to tell them like enjoy a yeah, little bit yeah. more chill and just feel that you don't have to push it so hard all right. the time but at the same time i'm very happy that they are pushing because yeah. then we get to witness amazing riding it's yeah. um it's two sides of it totally back in the day it was a bit more maybe rock rock starry a little yes, bit sure. with, with, oh so which, you're saying that you were you were a rock star back in the day uh, yeah okay I, that's okay that, no that wasn't what i was planning to say but yes 
No, I, I mean that approach. You know? <laughs> no, okay, we, uh... can't take it back. So I want to, I want to talk a little bit about like throughout this, this our conversation. Like, I want to touch on kind of the different phases of an athlete, and like you kind of touched on it a little bit there. Like, you know, you have your beginning, your rock star phase. <laughs> but I remember uh, hearing you talk about how when you fell in love with mountain biking, you didn't even know it was a sport right? Like you just mm. thought of it as riding bikes and things like that. Can you take me back to the beginning, uh, like discovering the bike for the first time? Yeah. Now it can almost seem funny for people, I guess, that I didn't even know of the sport because back then I didn't really have internet and uh, my friends actually, uh, my neighbor bought some New World Disorder movies online. Yeah. And that was kind of when we started to like Okay, so you can actually, we really enjoyed like riding our bikes around and just doing wheelies. But then when we saw people were jumping off cliffs and stuff, and we were like, this, this looked cool. Really? So, uh, yeah. That's so interesting. So it was very free ride yeah. inspired back then. But then as with almost any sport, first you jump off cliffs. And then when you have jumped off a cliff, then you're like, oh, I wonder if I can do a one-hander or no-hander or so a backflip or a 360. You were like immediately gravitated to tricks. Was it because because I I think it's interesting because when I first started riding mountain bikes, my friend showed me a bunch of World Cup race videos. Yeah, and then like I went off and raced the World Cups. Uh, Although I did see New World Disorder, and I just thought it was crazy. Yeah. So like, how did you kind of go from first starting yeah. to ride the bike to say like, oh, I I want to jump off a cliff or I want to do a backflip or? Yeah. I'm actually very happy that it wasn't a sport when i when i grew up because i could 100 percent do it just for yeah. the joy i didn't have any plan to like i want to be a world champion or i want to get sponsors or it was like that was just off the table yeah it was so far away that it would never happen so yeah. i think those years i'm very happy that i had those years before even realizing that it was something i just did it 100 percent out of passion with my my friends we just went out riding and it was yeah, I didn't have any like back back thoughts with it, with anything. It was just hundred percent joy. So uh, that was I, I'm, I can really feel now that I'm really happy that I had those those years where it was no pressure and uh, and that. But then I could feel pretty early. I've always been pretty good at competing. So I I felt early that I that I was riding better if someone was watching. And yeah, yeah sure. so, <laughs> because that is an interesting thing, right? There's yeah. some people are really good riders, but get worse yes. when people are watching and the pressure. And some riders are maybe not as good even, but are better at competing and can like step up a couple of levels. The first time you kind of realized that? I guess I didn't realize back then that it was a skill. Yeah. I just, I guess back then I just thought everyone, it was the same for everyone. Sure. Uh, it, I was also lucky that, like, the first years, the sport really took off in Sweden. So I've, I've been telling some of the kids that I think we had, like, 10 to 15 slope-style contests in Sweden when I started. So that was also very lucky because I got to practice competing. And as you know from racing, you really need to practice racing. Yeah. It's not just – it doesn't usually come – the same way you practice tricks or the same way you practice going fast on your bike, you have to practice competing as well yeah. to like For deal sure. with the pressure. And yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, there's a big difference between probably for you um, doing a backflip or, or doing a, your biggest trick in your backyard or, you know, at the local spot and then doing it with thousands of people watching on a moment's notice when everything counts. Oh man, it's night and day, yeah, and that's yeah. why it's so many world champions in their backyard. Or like, yeah, yeah that's right. sure, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, we talk about it too. Yeah. Like when we were racing, you would be like, watch somebody in practice, and you would say why they should be winning. Exactly. Like, there, there's no way that anyone is going faster than them down no, the hill. No, exactly. No, it's uh, it is very interesting, and I guess that is what makes sports so cool that yeah. you as we talked about before the full package like you need everything you yeah. need to be focused training you need to be talented but also the other mental part and um, yeah we all know the mental part is 
probably almost 50 50. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. So, can you tell me about um, that first contest you did in White Style? <laughs> I, just amazing, amazing memories, but I was, I was terrified. Before that, I, I should say that I was always kind of a scared young man. I, I, I like to be at home, have everything like, yeah, I wanted a safe environment because I was a little bit, yeah. It seems weird since I chose a dangerous sport, but in some way, yeah, I just uh, really wanted um, yeah, to feel, to feel safe, I guess. So for the first event, when I got an invite to, to Austria, to, uh, to White Style, I remember that my mom was like, so Martin, Martin, you're, you're usually, you know, you're pretty scared. Should I join you? Yeah, right. But then it was almost <laughs> like, I didn't know what was worse. Like yes. Yes, being, <laughs> being terrified of traveling or showing up to all the, you know, and, 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 things and everyone like, this is my mom. Yeah, she will, she will, she will join, join well, us. So I, I was like, it was, it was two shitty scenarios, but I choose I, to go without my mom I, I, and be I, so scared. I chose my mom. My mom. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that maybe that explains a lot about us. The rock star and the nerd. Oh my god. I'm kidding. Okay. 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 So you were you were there, White Style. You were you're rock star in your way yeah. through with Andre. Well, I mean, paint a little picture of about um, who Andre and Cam Sink. Like it's it's ironic that you went to this first contest and what you were staying with all these people that ended up being you guys were became the superstars of the sport. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, they were pretty much all the superstars of the sport. And um, actually, me and Pilgrim, uh, Sam Pilgrim, shared room, and I think that was that was really good for us because we were both the like young guns. Yeah, it would almost have been maybe not ideal for us to hang out with the super rock stars of the <laughs> sport like the, the games i just mentioned yeah it was almost good for us to get to know everything and experience it together and yeah. um and then it's it's funny really fast both me and pilgrim kind of climbed our way into the the top the top level of the sport and then i think for like almost five years we almost mm. like first and second first and second on yeah. on most events at least in europe and then uh, in north america obviously brandon and bearclaw and all those guys uh, battled there and then back then it was pretty much just one crankworks mm -hmm. in whistler so right. that was kind of when we always had the, the yeah. big uh, the big throwdown sure can you talk a little bit about um kind of that shift and transition from being the underdog to having expectations oh yeah that's uh um, I, I think that's that is the hardest thing almost in uh, in a sportsman or an athlete's life to to go from always it's just joy and you always improve and then in the end you're up there and there's only downside almost it's pretty much you stand at you stand at the start and like if i don't win it's it's bad or like if i'm not first or second so that is um it's hard <laughs> it really is hard and i i don't know if you can ever um i guess the only thing you can tell yourself is just like try really to not think about it too much and not wor worry too much about and zoom out and be like okay i'm i'm here at this amazing event i made it all the way here try to enjoy but oh that's hard it's i try to tell all the young swedish riders every event like try to go there and right. just enjoy you have no pressure yeah you have so many years still yeah. but it's hard yeah it is uh, when you stand up there with the crowd watching and you know that yeah sponsors are are watching and maybe even if you do good you can maybe make money so you can go to another event or yeah, yeah it is um it's more than people uh i think think when you when you stand right. up there it's a lot to to deal with i it, you know it's so funny thinking about it because when you're young like you were saying the only thing you want to do is skip over everything you want to like 
speed run. Yes. In there, like I always laugh when uh, when kids are like, "Oh, I can't wait till I have a a factory contract or whatever on the race team." And I'm like, "Well, you do know that your parents are driving you. They're paying for you to be there. You're staying in a hotel. You have your dad working on your bike. That is not really that many it's expectations. A, it's a pretty good life. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's so absolutely. fascinating. Um, it is. Yeah, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about like kind of the hidden side of the best." Um, and like what goes into it because like it's one thing to get there and you kind of mentioned like you and, and pilgrim being one and two what what motivates you i guess at that point right like is it you win, you win a contest you, you go to crankworks you go to all these places and you're up at the top and so like what switches right like because in the beginning you're kind of trying to reach that moment and then once you're there what was your motivation I think there's a couple of things and I would guess different for, for everyone. Uh, I guess in some way you could call it a, a drug in some way when obviously when people are applauding you and um, that is uh, a pretty strong, strong force, right? Mm -hmm. To um, if you have felt that rush, you want to you want to feel it again when everyone is just like good job right. and like yeah and it's pretty much only an athlete that get to experience that yeah right yeah. it's not like doctors or uh, right. where people are just like yes so was man. it was so it like for you was it um like standing on the podium that was the was the reward or was it kind of the external feedback yeah external feedback uh -huh. people are just uh, yeah it really it gives you a feel and it is such a rush like when you risk your life and everyone <laughs> yeah. i mean imagine it's like yeah. oh you know all about it yeah. that it's like yeah. like all your all emotions totally. in your body just explode yeah and um it is uh, it is hard to uh, compare it to uh, to anything else mm -hmm. and i think that is why many and most athletes may Maybe you feel that times, yeah, right. and then maybe ten times you feel this, yeah. and then the older you get, or like more, right. then you also feel, and you're trying this. to get back, yes, exactly. Yeah. And then yeah. after a while, you realize, oh, maybe I'm never gonna feel that again. Right. Why? Why did I not enjoy it? Right. When I was yes, totally. And there we get to that point again, where yeah. you're like, where we try to tell the the young kids, enjoy it, enjoy yeah. it while you can, because it's gonna be. It's gonna be over fast. Totally. But yeah. it's also easy to talk about this in a negative way. That's not really not what I'm what I'm trying to do because it, it is an amazing journey and For it's something sure. that most people don't get to experience. So I really understand why people are yeah. working super hard to get to the point because it's, it is amazing. It's uh it's so funny. I feel like we probably had the uh, I've talked to a, a couple of different athletes, kind of all of different disciplines, and it's so interesting because when you're in the bubble, like when you're there everything feels like it's just the not not the end of the world but it's it is the world exactly like everyone is here be, because they're here to see the competition all this stuff but then you come back in a different context like for me it was when i first started working for red bull and i would go there and i would look at all my friends and i'd be like dude you are stressed <laughs> like you yeah. need to chill out but yeah. it's almost impossible to to do that it almost feels like as an athlete you have to be in that because without that kind of tightly wound thing like you can't perform at that level true it's um, yeah maybe you need that to push yourself to yeah. that limit no i i absolutely yeah i agree and so um for you i feel like it kind of got cut short a little bit early not that moment i guess because of your injury yeah um Tell us about that and, and kind of what that was like to go through. Yeah, no, just as you say, it almost, and I'm very proud of it. So it's not that I'm really on my top of the game fighting for the Joyride win. In the end, Semenuk won that year and I got second and broke my, my leg and was off the bike for nine, nine months, I think. And I don't know, it's... Also, leading up to that part, I didn't have a single injury. So it's like, now when I think back at it, it's almost like, wow, I was really lucky that I got 
get to the top of my level before I had my first injury. So it's easy to be bummed that it could have been even better, but it could have been so much worse. Like now when I see athletes that maybe do their first or second event and get a bad injury, that is really hard to, to overcome. So, um, but obviously I would like to go back and tell myself to chill now, take a year, you're still young, you're, I was 24 or something and like, you can work your way back. But obviously like many people do, I was stressing, came back way too early according to like how strong I was in the body. And then almost unlucky, I got a really good comeback and I think I was second again in a world tour event. So then I started pushing even more and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm back again. And, and then I pretty much had back-to-back -back injuries for four or five years. And after that, I could really, when I came out on the other side of that, I could really feel that my body was like so reminded of pain. Yeah. As soon as I jumped on the bike, I could still do the tricks, but in there I was like, it was almost like I, I, because my brain wanted to do it so bad that I right. still, I still did it. Yeah. But I could feel in the air that I was like, I, mm. I, I was, I, I was scared. Yeah. And then for many years I kept on going, but it was almost like when I got to the finish line, it was like more of a relief. Um, than, yeah. yeah. I, I survived. Yeah. So it wasn't that. As we talked about before, it wasn't this rush when I got to the finish line. I'm like, yeah. I'm the man. It was more like, oh, okay, I yeah. can keep my sponsors for, uh, for, <laughs> and I get my paycheck for yeah. uh, a couple of more. Um, uh, so that's it's it's too, and obviously, back then it was only pressure from myself actually. Like my sponsors have always been, I have to say that, have been very cool. Yeah. And like saying, do your thing. Take it easy. So, usually, sometimes you have idiot sponsors that push you hard, yeah, sure. and that happens to uh, to people, and that's a bummer. But I would say most of the time the pressure comes from yourself. Yeah, uh, and we usually are our own uh, worst enemies. I guess. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Was there a moment? I, I think for me, I remember like coming down this downhill run and like halfway down my race run, I was like, man, I would rather be anywhere but here. And that was kind of the moment where I was like, okay, this is not, I can't be in this mindset and be racing and all of these things. Was there a moment where you said, okay, I'm not going to compete anymore rather than kind of push through this, you know, just pressure and relief uh, circle? I think for me, it was almost my body that told me I think I've always been very headstrong, yeah. or whatever you say, which is obviously a good thing, but also a bad thing. It also yeah. makes you not listen to what your guts or what your soul is trying to tell you. And I think yeah. my soul was tell, trying to tell me, like, Martin, you're you're terrified. Like, you don't don't push yourself so hard yeah. to do these tricks and stuff. So, um, yeah. No, for me, um, nah, now I kind of lost where I was, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, just like, just being able to push yourself. Um, exactly. No, but as you said, like, I think it was more my whole body that told me, like, with anxiety and stuff that, like, you are are done. Yeah. <laughs> like, my body, my, my brain still wanted to push. Yeah. And, like, you can keep on doing this. You can... Uh, but it was more my my body that just started to pretty much shut down really? which is interesting yeah what so what what did that look like i mean people that have had anxiety knows that it's just you can't really you can't really control it it's like you're trying to tell yourself like don't feel pressure like all is good everything is but you can just feel that it's something inside of you that it's just and you always like, struggle even if you don't have to be stressed like when you just wanted to go out in the woods and just enjoy you try that but still something like eating you up from uh, it's, uh, oh it was really scary and and that's when you kind of realize that it's more it's more to life yeah. than like so but it was it was really hard for me yeah. to stop because 
also as a bike pro, as you know, you have the summer and then you have the full winter. So then you also have time to kind of recover and be away from all the pressure for a bit. So then when I got to, like when you start to sign contracts again in January, February or like around that time, then I was like, I'm actually feeling pretty good again. I then yeah. the brain is good at forgetting. Like <laughs> yeah. the summer was so, and oh, I matured so much. I, yeah, I can deal with that now. Uh -huh. And then when the season is, so that's what I'm a little bit bummed about. That I'm like, in some way, I just wish that I would have said, okay, I stop with the big videos. I stop with going to like the big events. Maybe even stop with the really big brands uh, a little bit earlier because yeah. I just pushed it so hard that almost now when I show, show up to Crankworx, I almost feel like that my my hair on the arms and like are starting to rising just because my 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 whole system is like reminding me like danger, danger. Yeah, <laughs> in every way, this, like physically, yeah. mentally. Exactly. Yeah. Which is such a bummer because I have so many friends here, yeah. and uh, it is just amazing memories. So as I said. If you can maybe stop, at a, I, if I can look back, I wish I would have stopped a little bit earlier just so I didn't have to deal with all the really, really like dark, yeah. dark stuff and that I wouldn't push myself that hard. Yeah. It sounds like maybe you stopped a little bit earlier than, uh, than I did. Yeah, I think it was, uh, it was interesting because I think I had everything maybe was just condensed where yeah. at the beginning of the year it felt like everything was perfect and then it just totally spiraled where i feel like if i could go back and just tell myself uh it just it's okay like you can just things sports are, are not deterministic like you can do everything perfect and you cannot win the gold medal you cannot win the race like all of these different things and i think it is one of the reasons why, like as an athlete, it is so hard to when you see athletes retire and then they come back, and like you hear about athletes retiring, kind of like struggling mentally because it, to me, it, it's your whole kind of identity. What was that time like for you, like kind of having this anxiety and like going through the the valley, if you will, I guess, of like athletic retirement? Yeah. No. In some way, I guess maybe it made it a little bit almost easier for me that I almost hit rock bottom, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that I didn't have a I didn't have an option. Yeah, like, sure. like, <laughs> was, the only way was out. <laughs> yeah, but seriously, and uh, it was in some way maybe that was good for me. Yeah. That's like I just couldn't like I felt anxiety as yeah. soon as I just thought about riding yeah. a bike. So it was pretty obvious that like okay now you the most important thing is just to feel good again yeah. like to so then for two years i yeah basically didn't ride my bike that much at all and just cross-country skied was riding a lot of like fitness biking like road biking and, uh, and cross-country riding and entered some <laughs> entered some small small events in uh, in sweden and stuff and i think that was also really good for me to just feel like a beginner again yeah, and true. feel feel that joy again yeah. after like pushing for so long yeah. to just yeah do something completely new and also maybe use something new in your brain right. like if i mean it's obviously still biking so it sounds like I, I did something completely different but it felt like i did something <laughs> yeah. completely different and um yeah but yeah to turn it around now i it was very good for me yeah. and now i can at least I can see why I feel the way I, I do now when I show up here at, at Crankworx and I can kind of separate that like, okay, Martin, it's fine that you are scared when right. you show up here because you can remember, but try to like enjoy seeing your friends again, seeing your partners and like yeah. everyone. And, and it's, it's, it's humbling as well now when I've been away from the sport for two years that you know, when I'm at home, no one really recognized me yeah, on sure. the street. So when I'm walking here, I'm almost like, I'm so humbled when someone <laughs> comes up to me and like, can I have an autograph? So yeah, it's like, sure. it's really like, oh my God, he remembers me. And it's like, and it, it, 
yeah, and it, it is a really cool feeling. Like yeah. before, it was like, oh, so annoying. Just yeah, another sure. runner, and yeah. now sure. it's weird. Like when yeah. you take things for granted, it's yeah, like, totally. but now when you've been away from it, it's yeah. almost like, wow. Yeah. I, it's and now I feel like, wow, I really almost I'm proud of myself because right. like, yeah. oh, wow, you can be. I'm, that's so. It's such a great word to say. Like to go from uh, all of the emotions to like land on proud is super cool i uh it, it's so funny you tell that story because i was um i was somewhere a, a little while ago and i was talking to my mom on the phone and somebody like kind of yelled out like hey like i'm a big fan or whatever and she just said enjoy it while it lasts <laughs> <laughs> that's so crazy. yeah i was it's, like yeah for it's sure. true yeah because yeah i guess that's why we said that we're trying to tell the other yeah. athletes like totally enjoy it yeah because it's not gonna it's not gonna be there forever yeah so. and so do you remember kind of what it was because now you're you're riding a little bit more you're able to come here what was the thing that kind of sparked that joy of biking again good question i guess it's it was a little bit that i got back to the point where I started riding bikes, just going out in the woods, doing wheelies, and not feel that I have to, I guess also lowered, I lowered my expectations. I think that's a big thing as well. When I was at the top of the game, I always felt like every time I go out and ride, I need to perform. I need to be the best every time I ride my bike. And that is draining. <laughs> so, uh, to be able to go out and be like, you know what? I have nothing to live up to. I don't have to be the best today when I go out and bike. I can just do a skid and feel good about it. Like, yeah, sure. I don't Look have back. to exactly. I don't have to put up a camera and then realize like, oh, I could have done that better. I could have. It's. I think that's important. And I think for me, uh, as I said. I really enjoyed, I really, really, really enjoyed the beginning yeah. when, when I just went out, being in the nature, just yeah. no pressure. And I think that I was so good, at, or I was talented at competing, almost made it that I felt that it is what I have to do. Or like, it was almost like, it wasn't what I, that it wasn't why I got it why I loved biking in the first place. It wasn't, it just happened that I started competing. And I think that's why I, I kind of forgot about what I really loved to do, which was just being almost by myself in the woods and just jumping on a small yeah, stone. Sure. But then when all the crowds and everything came around, I, I think I just kind of forgot about that. Yeah. And I thought that was what I loved. Yeah. But I think that was more like just ego. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe an interesting way to frame it. Uh, if you could, if we said there's like three phases, you as like first discovering the bike, going out, riding, you know, first starting to do a bunch of tricks and things like that, like early Martin. And then there's the Martin that is competing, you know, going to Craig Works, trying to be the best. And then there is now Martin. What do you feel like your relationship to the bike is? Like, how would you describe that at each one of those phases? I mean, first phase was obviously just euphoria, almost. That it was, I was like, at night, just couldn't wait to wake up and like reading bike magazines. And just 100% joy and 100%, yeah, it was... Uh, the best thing in my life which was uh, amazing but the, i feel like three phases is not enough we need we need we need ten. <laughs> no but and then in the beginning of uh, of the competing obviously that was amazing i mean getting yeah all the parts that you've been looking at that you couldn't afford people just send them to you and i mean obviously that was amazing and people loved what you did and everything so that was amazing as well and traveling the world with your friends and when everything was fun but then obviously that fades a little bit and in the end of maybe your uh, my competing career it changed a lot so maybe we could do that we do four phases yeah 
So second phase is when everything was super fun with competing and everything was good. And then maybe second phase was more feeling pressure, sleepless nights, knowing that tomorrow I have to deliver, have to risk my life again. Yeah. And then we maybe have... do two because after that, maybe there's five because then yeah. there is kind of the the lot like the the loss, I guess. Yeah. True. Yeah, for sure. And then last phase. Just what we was said you... proud. Yeah. Pr proud yeah. of uh, yeah. the whole yeah. journey. Yeah. And that's uh it feels like a good a good way to to land. Yeah. Uh because uh I could and especially when you're it's almost it's almost easy to forget when you're at home as i said like at home no one when i'm out cross-country skiing it's not like anyone is like yeah martin <laughs> take job at crankworks 2014. they're like that would never you, happen can you get out of the way actually <laughs> yeah, <It's> like, <laughs> exactly. martin. Yeah. But I'm, yeah someone's yelling martin i think that they're gonna gonna be like i want your autograph but it's actually get out of the way you're so slow <laughs> <laughs> and so now yeah. I feel like one of the things that I I think is interesting your um, your partner Ida is a world champion and you also are a coach to some really amazing Swedish soap fly athletes and so there's this also like how do you view the bike through other people like what is it like being um, in a relationship where your your partner is also amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's been really good for us. I feel like we're very synced. She was a former XAO, yeah, junior world champion and was pushing really hard as well. Um, and then she kind of almost, she just got to the point a little bit earlier than me when she was 21 and felt like, you know what, this is uh, this is it. I've been world champion. And so I, I would say she was maybe, she had a bit more healthy relationship with everything. I tried to push so hard yeah. and clang yeah. or cling onto the, the biking where she was, I think, yeah, left it a little bit in the right time. And now she really enjoys it. And now I enjoy it again, but yeah. I took since I pushed it so hard, it took a couple of uh, couple of years. Yeah. But going back to coaching, I feel like that's it's really cool. I can uh, and now also when I have some perspective, I can really feel that I have something to give, which is uh, a cool feeling. I think when you're when you're an athlete yourself, you're so in in, in your own head that it's almost hard to focus on other other people. And maybe after what you also need it to sink in, maybe and to figure out like what did I do wrong or what did I do right so that is um, it's a very cool feeling and next year I think we have 18 slope cell athletes wow. in, in my class or what is it about so Sweden that like just pumps out slope cell athletes dude it seems like yeah everything we we touch now turns into <laughs> gold almost yeah but like yeah, sure. it's been crazy like since I had my breakthrough Almost straight after, we had Anton Tillander, uh, Max Fredriksson, and then so many. I mean, every year we almost had like those main main riders, but almost like a new one, a new bubbler, like com coming in as well. And same, that is almost the coolest part that now I've had one student for three years and he just graduated and he's now, he was in the in the event today. So that feels like yeah, a really cool journey because he was also like the first first one I had from start to graduation, graduation all three years. So it's uh, I feel like yeah, it, it feels very cool to uh, to see him as when he started when he could like barely jump and then now see him in that crankworks. It's uh, then you almost feel even more how cool it is to be a coach yeah and to see them uh, grow up so fast yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and hear it in your voice <laughs> oh so it was uh, yeah i i really like it and uh, also it's really good for me that three times uh, a week they have the training and then instead of me just standing there and yelling i can also jump on my bike yeah, and right. ride with them and i think that's uh, it's also very good for me because it also reminds me that 
sometimes when you have the background that I have, it's almost sometimes hard to get on the bike mm -hmm. because back in, in the back of your mind, you remember these like pressure. You have to do something good. Even if I not at all have to do that anymore, it's, it's still in the back of my mind sometimes. So it's almost hard to get out there. But then when now I have four training, it makes me go ride my bike four times a week for two hours, two, three hours. And also, I mean, to hang out with young, pumped kids, it is also like a lot. It, it's the perfect way for me to, since in the end, it was a lot serious for me with biking and to see them that have that joy that I had when I started riding also reminds me of the very amazing parts about bike riding. So uh, I'm in a, in a good spot right now. That is so cool. What a like many, many full circle moments. Yeah, like. throughout this. Yeah, we've been, we've been around. This. I'm almost dizzy. <laughs> okay, so I have a couple of bonus questions yes. for you. Um, do you remember your earliest memory on a bike? Ooh, it was uh, when I was uh, 11, I think, I went to the local bike shop and I was there every day after school looking at this B1 Sydney model of uh, a mountain bike. But my parents were like, ah, it's way too expensive. You can't, you can't have that. And I think it was like 500 euros. So. <laughs> Cheap, cheap <laughs> bastards. <laughs> no, but, but they were like, no, we can't, we can't put that on a bike. Like you're just gonna ride to school and back. Uh, so I, I still remember, and I also, I still get a nice feeling when I go into a bike shop with that rubber taste because. Hey, so like, you, it's not even your earliest memory. Is not even like being on a bike. It was like seeing this, like yeah, yeah, crazy. like standing there in the. And it was like up there, almost yes, on a like sir. on a shelter, and I couldn't. I couldn't reach it. And then one day, my parents, or like for Christmas, they bought me that bike. And uh, yeah, it's it's also really crazy with this butterfly effect, huh? How like, if I wouldn't have got that bike, I wouldn't be a bike rider. Yeah, I know. And how crazy is that? I always... And like, if my neighbor wouldn't have... If, I, if my parents wouldn't have moved into that house next to the neighbor that looked at the new World Disorder movies, I wouldn't have been a bike rider. How scary is that? It's so wild. I, I had, I mean, my intro was almost the same where I was, we used to ride a bunch of dirt jumps and there just happened to be a mountain biker that was there and we used to make fun of him because who rides mountain bikes? Yeah. And, and then he was like, oh, you should come and ride some downhill. And I powered a bike i loved it and then he showed me a bunch of race videos that happened to be world cup videos and then you know next thing you know i'm in whistler and it's uh it is like these little tiny moments that you don't even realize almost scary but uh very cool at the same time yeah so um so my next question when you first started riding bikes uh what did you think was impossible that you think is easy now what I thought was impossible. Yeah. <laughs> Make a living out of, out of riding <laughs> now, a bicycle. Now it's easy. You're just here, just cruising. <laughs> so easy. Yeah. Just send some I invoices. Think my <laughs> takeaway from this one is it's easy to make a living and you're a rock star. <laughs> yeah. Such a humble guy. <laughs> okay. I didn't think about it like, ah, oh, man, you're, you're twisting my words. <laughs> I told you. We were like talking about gotcha interviews. And next thing you know. Okay. Um, what is one thing that you want to do for yourself this year? Wow. That is a good, uh, a good one. Um, Wow, I'm not very. My girlfriend would would admit that I'm not very generous, like with, with myself. I don't have the very high expectations in in life. I guess. Yeah, I guess just enjoy, yeah. enjoy life. Yeah. Pretty much. I don't need that much in life. Just to, uh, yeah, just feel feel good. Yeah, and uh, yeah, enjoy enjoy life. And finish, finish my house, or the, our house. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That's uh, a great. That's yeah, a we, great one. We bought a, we bought a house, and it feels really good. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. Finish the, finish the garage. Have good, uh, yeah. All the old uh, Red Bull helmets. Yeah. 
old frames yeah. so I could just sit there and <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty good. That kind of yeah, exactly. Bring my future kids in there and tell them stories. Back in my day. <laughs> okay, so our final traditional closing question is who inspires you? Wow. Uh, who inspires me? I guess anyone that can keep it fun still and find a way to like yeah <laughs> do do what they what they love and uh without getting too much focused on money or uh, things like that and just staying with uh, the pure the pure passion and uh, i hope i hope i'm moving that that way at least that's uh that's my my goal i don't know if that's if, if that was an answer to your question I think that's a great one because I think that's actually so incredibly hard to do something that you love for a long time and and continue to love it. Yeah, keep as it. you did at the start. Yeah, exactly. Keep it, keep it fun. So, uh, but yeah, anyone, anyone that does that, I can't point out a specific person right now, but um, that person is. It's out there. <laughs> I'm going to find them. <laughs> and I'll get back to you. <laughs> well, Martin, thank you so much for joining us. It's been so good. Thank you. Yes. Always a pleasure. Yeah. You're uh, very good at your job. <laughs> Yearning. My heart is aching, a little way it's turning